It's a legend of heroes. Link's a very valiant character, but with a big heart. Tries really hard. He's very kind, very gentle. I mean, in some ways, he kind of reminds me of Miyamoto, actually. Miyamoto and Zelda, I've always felt, kind of give you that experience of going back to your childhood. It's a legend of new worlds. But what was really fun was creating all these areas to explore. Going into the mountains and finding uh, caves and whatnot. It's a legend of epic struggles. Of course, Nintendo didn't really like that game. Disavowed all knowledge of it and doesn't really talk about it. Great! I'll grab my stuff! Zelda, to me, changed video games pretty much forever. That's really the most fun and exciting part about developing games is where players are able to enter this world themselves. It's the Legend of Zelda. In 1983, an established Japanese gaming company named Nintendo releases their first home console called the Famicom. The success of the console paves the way for young game designer Shigeru Miyamoto and his new title borrowed from a classic American author, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Zelda, you know, uh, well, actually, uh, the name Zelda, you know, we were kind of looking for uh, this name for kind of this eternal beauty or this eternal strong woman and we kind of thought you know what kind of a name could we use and we actually uh, looked at Fitzgerald's wife Zelda she's actually perfect so we kind of took her name in 1986 Zelda is released in Japan on the Famicom disk system an add-on feature for the Famicom yeah, I think the original Zelda stood out because it was so epic for its time a really big Nintendo game with a story you know simple as it was for the time it was pretty important the story puts you in the role of Link, a lovable little boy who goes on the adventure of a lifetime while trying to save Zelda, the princess of Hyrule. Miyamoto is really interested in taking things that he experienced in his childhood and turning them into video games. And not really specific experiences per se, but, you know, a feeling. Walking through a forest and seeing a little cave. As a kid, you're just scared to go in but transfer that to a video game and you can go in, you don't have anything to lose and you can explore and live through the whole excitement of it. In spite of the failing video game market in the US, Nintendo introduces both the Nintendo Entertainment System, also known as the NES or NES, and another Miyamoto masterpiece, Super Mario Brothers. Super Mario, Super Mario Brothers was a game that was very action-based and was very much about moving your body and being active to get your way through the game. The release of the NES opens the road for Link and his entourage, and in 1987, they debut on the Nintendo Entertainment System in the form of The Legend of Zelda. Because I had started the, working on the initial ideas for both Zelda and Super Mario Brothers essentially at the same time, but we decided to quit working on Zelda for a while and complete Super Mario Brothers first. Then we actually decided later on to relook at our work on Zelda and, and complete that game. With Zelda, what I really tried to do was create create a scenario where the player would get to into a situation and wouldn't know what they were supposed to do and so they would have to use their brain rather than their body and they would have to think their way through situations. I felt, you know, relieved and almost rescued to a certain extent because Zelda in Japan was the very first game that was released for this Famicom disk system and so if that game had failed then the hardware itself probably would have failed as well. So when we released the game and people thought the game was very fun and it became such a success, I felt very relieved and very happy. But what was really attractive in, in the first Zelda game was that it did away with just having a, a side-scrolling level where you get to the end and then, boom, things restart and you're in a different level and do the same thing again. It had a, an organic overworld. And what's the story behind this Link guy? He's a character who starts off very young and, you know, essentially a small child. And gradually, through his experiences, he grows and he becomes stronger and he matures. Link's a very valiant um, character, but with a big heart. Tries really hard. He's very kind, very gentle. He'd be a fun date. He's a pretty cool guy. I like him. 
However, the hardware on the NES has its limitations. Family computer. The family computer, the NES, had very limited capabilities for essentially drawing pictures for the graphics. So one of the biggest challenges with the game was trying to create many different types of enemies with these limited graphical capabilities. And actually, if you look at it, a lot of them, you can see kind of inverted images of other enemies in the game. And I actually did a lot of those drawings by hand myself. Really, I think looking back at Zelda and given the limitations of the hardware, I really do think that it was very well done for what was capable at that time. And the man behind the legend believes in creating a totally immersive experience for the player. This is a type of game where we want the player to use their mind. And you start off in an area and you can walk in any direction and you don't really know what it is you're supposed to be doing or what it is you can do. You could walk around and there's a dungeon entrance, you could go in and fight monsters. Or you could decide to not go in and go somewhere else first. The game was so non-linear that you could get yourself into a lot of trouble, too. Obviously, you know, we can't just leave the player there not knowing what to do, because if they don't know what to do, then they're not going to play. So trying to find the balance of kind of leading the player into what they need to do and forcing them to think about how they need to solve the problems was very difficult. We spent a lot of time on that. Composer Koji Kondo uses the simple tools available on the NES to create several background tracks, including the now-famous Zelda theme. Back in the 80s, a lot of video games had very generic music. Usually the programmers themselves were in charge of making the music, so you'll get a game like Frogger where they take a children's song. But with Zelda, they actually had a, a musician, Koji Kondo, do the score, and he came up with this great theme. So that was a big step in video gaming. You could really appreciate the melody because it was so catchy. Not just the, the Zelda song, but also the chord that played. You know, when you find a secret, the do 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 Everybody knows that. The Legend of Zelda is also one of the first games to allow users to save their adventure. So you could save your game to cartridge. So for the first time, then, you could track the data of your game and the progress. And you didn't have to sit here and play a game for eight hours straight. You could boot up Zelda, play for a couple hours, save, go have lunch, go to dinner, whatever, come back, pick up where you left off before. The Legend of Zelda sells a million copies in the U.S. and launches Zelda and Link into video game stardom. In Japan, a lot of people bought these stationery based on the Zelda franchise, backpacks, t-shirts. While The Legend of Zelda is still amazing American audiences, Nintendo prepares for their trip back to Hyrule. But some fans aren't too happy with the outcome. By 1989, Saving a Princess has become a national phenomenon. Mr. Miyamoto's position is firmly cemented as the creative force behind Zelda and Nintendo. And while American audiences are still embracing The Legend of Zelda, the curtain rises for the sequel. Gamers are very particular with their franchises, and if you mess with the franchise too much and evolve it too much, people are upset. And the same thing happened with uh, Zelda too. When that came out, Everybody was expecting a more beautiful or a more advanced version of the first game with more dungeons, more monsters to fight. What they got was a completely different game. And so really what we tried to do with Zelda 2, while it was definitely a continuation of the story, we tried to make it into a very different game. If you look at Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, that's really more of kind of an action and a more physically oriented game than the original Legend of Zelda was, which was definitely more mental and more problem solving. In that sense, it's definitely a very different game. The second Zelda, I waited with uh, bated breath. It was a very, very, very good game, very solid. You know, it was almost kind of closer to a Dragon Warrior meets uh, Mario kind of game. It was very strange in a different direction, but I still played it, thoroughly enjoyed it. Despite the changes, Zelda II, The Adventure of Link, sells over five million copies worldwide. Miyamoto and his team immediately begin work on a new installment that will take years to finish. I think a lot of people were starting to forget about the Zelda franchise took a long time from Zelda 2 to Zelda 3. In 1991, boom, there was this new game, and it was spectacular. I mean, it really turned heads, and it sold really well, too. 
The third installment, Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, goes back to its birthplace and makes its appearance on the newest Nintendo system, the Super Nintendo, also known as the SNES. With the third game, they went back to Zelda 1. After some people complained about Zelda 2 and said, oh yeah, yeah, this is cool, but it's so much of a departure from Zelda that it's not really like the first game anymore. Nintendo said, yeah, we had it right with the first one. Let's just give it better graphics, expand the item system, make it bigger, make it cooler looking, and create something that's like the first game, but much more expansive. But what it did have was this beautiful art style. You know, it looked like a picture book almost. You had to think three-dimensionally. For example, if you were on the second floor of a certain dungeon, you had to actually push a block into a hole to make it drop down to the first floor. Or, you know, in another dungeon, you had to blow up the ceiling of a room so light could pour into the basement and something would happen. That was cool. You didn't really have that before. A link to the past flies off the shelves. The popularity of the Zelda series is proven once again. With an historical franchise underway, Nintendo jumps on the technology bandwagon and takes Link along for the ride. In the early 1990s or maybe the late 80s, the whole CD format became more and more popular. So of course the gaming industry looked at the CD and thought, hmm, you know, can we use this? It's you know, cheap to manufacture these guys compared with carts which have you know, complicated innards. And uh, they hold a lot of data. So maybe this is good for video games. Nintendo asks Philips to build a CD drive that attaches to the Super Nintendo. But as the months went by, they realized that maybe this CD system, it's a little bit early for it. It doesn't seem to really add anything. So Nintendo tried to wriggle out of that contract as well. So Philips was planning to release a standalone unit called the CDI that was an interactive CD player. One of the deal points was that certain Nintendo games would appear on the CDI. Hey! Phillips creates its own Zelda title, and Link Faces of Evil is released in 1993. Nintendo didn't want to make him, so Phillips contracted the company themselves. Out came this abomination of a game, partly because the CDI simply wasn't set up to be a gaming system. It didn't have a proper controller or anything. It was pretty bad graphics-wise. But they made this game, and man, that was a stinker. Cool, huh? That was a bad game. Jeez. So you get this really cheesy and dated cartoon stuff where Link talks to the prince and like, hey, yo. How about a kiss for luck? You've got to be kidding. Well, he's all suave and his hair is like this and it just looks really dumb. And uh, the gameplay itself was terrible. It went back to the Zelda 2 style gameplay. Of course, Nintendo didn't really like that game, disavowed all knowledge of it and doesn't really talk about it. Help. I'm stuck. Despite the poor reviews and lack of interest, Phillips releases two more Zelda games, The Wand of Gamelon, Free! I can't wait to bomb some Dodongos! And Zelda's Adventure. Go now, my princess, to rescue Link! But then quickly disappears. And in 1993, Nintendo designer Gunpei Yokoi introduces The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening to the Game Boy. Followed up five years later with The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX. So taking what people knew from the home consoles and put them on the portable was a match made in heaven. I like it just for like a quick kit, you know, then I'll put it back in my purse and it's really good for my downtime. Finally, you had Zelda on the go, you could play it wherever you went. Two more original Zelda games eventually appear on the Game Boy. Portable gamers are in Zelda heaven. It's really tough and time consuming to create a Zelda game. So Nintendo partnered with Capcom and said, how about you make the next Zelda games for us? And they were probably like, woohoo, you know? You don't get the chance to work on a big franchise like that every day. So they created Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons. Originally, there were supposed to be three games, actually, that were interlinking with passwords. But they had to scale back and they only released two games. Nintendo announces the release of their next system, the Nintendo 64. But will Zelda make the jump? How do you do an adventure game in 3D? Nintendo couldn't simply go to a store, buy another game, and say, oh, they did it right, because nobody did it right. And there's a surprising twist that will leave fans stunned. By 1998, the Zelda franchise has conquered all the Nintendo systems, and Miyamoto and his team of developers are working feverishly on finishing the epic Zelda 64. Aiji Aonuma, a future director of Zelda projects, joins Miyamoto's team. Original thought was to take 
essentially the Super NES game, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, and turn that into a 3D game on the N64. And that was our original idea for The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. So we took、uh, one of the items from A Link to the Past, which was an ocarina. And it wasn't featured very much, but we decided to essentially take that and make that kind of the main item in Ocarina of Time and use it as kind of this musical instrument that plays an important role in the game. But the production lags. The earliest showings of Zelda in 95,、uh, where you saw this demo of a very short and young looking Link fighting a knight. There were demos in 96, and they said, "Yep, it's coming out soon." There were demos in 97, they said, "Yep, it's coming out soon." The original Nintendo 64 Zelda was delayed because it was just such an epic, humongous game, and you know these take time. There is so much anticipation for the new game that the Guinness Book of World Records officially recognizes the Ocarina of Time as having more pre-orders than any other game in history: 350,000. When you're actually developing a game, it's really hard to see how it's going to turn out and whether or not it will be successful. But with Ocarina of Time, when we actually finished working on the game and saw what we had created, we were like, we were really surprised. We said, "Wow, we really may have done something great here." I think at that point, Mr. Miyamoto really thought that、uh, that we may have had a big hit on our hands. The game is finally released in both Japan and the U.S. and immediately sweeps both countries. The scope and depth leave gamers in shock. Miyamoto and his team succeeded in bringing all the elements of the original Zelda into the 3D world. Zelda, there's an all. Apart from being a type of game that forces players to think their way through problems, I think probably the next most important part of the Zelda experience is providing players an opportunity to feel like they are a part of the Zelda world. And I really think that with the 3D environments of the Ocarina of Time. It was really able to create the type of scenario and the type of world where players felt just completely immersed in the surroundings within the game. Mr. Miyamoto isn't one for wasting time. It's in there.、Uh, well, actually, right after we had completed the Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time, and things had started to just slow down for us, Mr. Miyamoto came to me and he said, "I want you to come up with a Zelda game that we can create within one year." So it was kind of based on that idea that we came up with this concept of having a limited time frame that you replay over and over again, and that essentially became the focus of Majora's Mask. In 2000, Majora's Mask is the second Zelda game released for the Nintendo 64. Well, you had an event. With、uh, Ocarina of Time, the events in that game weren't really fixed to a specific time frame. But with Majora's Mask, we actually had this limited time frame that the player would play over and over again. And so the player would essentially have to decide which of the multiple events that were occurring they wanted to essentially become a part of. But depending on how they interacted with them, then the events might change. And so really, this became an important part of the gameplay. Majora's Mask follows Link's fight to save a world from the impending crash of a moon. The story and gameplay are embraced by fans worldwide. Majora's Mask quickly becomes a bestseller. Once we released Majora's Mask, I wanted to see how dedicated they were going to be, and just how much of all the events that were occurring in the game they wanted to play through and experience. We received a lot of, of commendations for having created this game system that was unique and new, and that made us really happy. Knowing that the lifespan of the Nintendo 64 is coming to an end. Miyamoto begins work on a Zelda title that will eventually arrive on Nintendo's next-generation console. When Nintendo announced GameCube at Space World in Japan, they had this really cool footage of Link crossing swords with Ganondorf, and it looked really cool. So of course everybody said, "Wow!" Fast forward to the next Nintendo event, where Nintendo, for the very first time, was going to show actual gameplay footage. Expectations were high, and suddenly this really odd-looking Link comes up. And everybody is like, "What the heck is that?" With Wind Waker, we try to find the mode of expression that is best suited to a 3D Zelda. And this time, we really thought that how we portray the character's movements, proportions, would become very important to the player naturally feeling that they are a part of the world. They were taking the Zelda series and giving it a cartoon look. 
but once you play it and you realize that it's the same old Zelda, you'll be hooked, I guarantee you. With new world record pre-orders of half a million, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is released in spring 2003. After all these years of working on Zelda, I've been able to fully implement all the ideas that I've been wanting to get into a Zelda game into the Wind Waker. And I'm really happy by that, and I hope that people will really take the chance to, to look at it and enjoy it and experience it for what it is. Zelda seized and conquered the video game industry, and all the fans have to do now is sit and wait for the next one. I think, yeah, Miyamoto has a certain style. I think he understands what makes a game fun. I don't really think of Zelda as being a game, but really as being kind of a, a separate world where players are able to go on this adventure. I really kind of think of the games that I create as being a box. And in a very compact area, I try to provide players with as many tools as they need to entertain themselves. And with this adventure story and the player kind of exploring it on their own, that they will find so much to do to entertain themselves. How about a kiss? You've got to be kidding. Enough. My ship sails in the morning. I wonder what's for dinner. Oh, boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! You must conquer evil.